So thanks again to the organizers. Many people have thanked you all, but let me thank you again. Wonderful meeting, wonderful city, enjoying ourselves greatly. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about the problem having to do with the aggregation and fragmentation. So thinking of many entities, you know, they're moving around. When they move and touch, they coalesce. And then the coalesced thing may move on its own, but also there's a breaking. So breaking of a particular sort that I'll tell you. And the question generally that I'd like to ask is what happens at long times? At long times, you might reach a steady state. And this has actually been studied for quite a while uh, in the models that I'm going to talk about. And uh, the interesting thing is that there's actually a phase transition in the steady state as you vary, let's say, the density of the objects that you're dealing with. The particular focus of my talk today will be, how is the steady state approached? Traditional question of coarsening in statistical mechanics, but we will see that there are some surprises that come up because of the particular nature of this uh, process. The tool that I will use, which is actually very useful, is extreme value distributions. And we'll track extreme value distributions as the system evolves towards steady state. And then we'll see what they reveal. Right, so and to use this, let, so. Okay, so let me tell you about my collaborators, two young people at TIA for Hyderabad, uh, Argo and Chandrasekhar. Argo is a postdoc. Chandrasekhar is a master's level student. This work actually par formed part of his master's thesis. And now he is spending a year with us again. But this work goes back many years. I mean, the models go back many years. Um, and here is a list of people who were involved with this. So Priya Krishnamurthy, now at Stockholm. Stockholm, Satya, who is in the audience. Nimani, from Vienna, who is also in the audience right now. And Madan Rao, from Bangalore. OK. So let me move on, tell you a little bit about the, okay, before, before I tell you what the model is, let me just say something that is sort of obvious that these sorts of processes are ubiquitous. I mean, you can do experiments like shaken granular gases um, with compartments in physics, but they arise in chemistry, biology, and maybe even in sort of social settings. Like in India, we have parties, which are large and small and mixed. And sometimes one party merges with the other. On the other hand, individual people walk off from one party to the other. So it's, in some very broad sense, an aggregation fragmentation process. As I said, we'll be interested in two sorts of uh, sort of themes. One is, the phase transitions. So this is, as I said, earlier work, but I will tell you a little bit of, uh, about it in steady state and then focus on the approach. So the sorts of models I'll deal with, I'll actually deal with two models. Um, there's something called the zero range process, ZRP, which is a well-known model in statistical physics. And there's also something that I call CMAM, which is conserved mass aggregation model. This was work done long ago with uh, Supriya and Satya uh, in TIFR at that time. And uh, uh, we, we'll go ahead and define the models more closely as we go, we go ahead. Um, but in both of them, it turns out, there's a phase transition of a particular sort. Okay, so the well, I may as well tell you about the moves right away. I mean, the key point here is about the breaking. I mean, uh, there was a talk earlier, you know, in the meeting, Ellie Barkai talked about fragmentation, and he was talking about things breaking, you know, uh, arbitrarily. Here, the breakage occurs only one particle at a time. It's like a chipping move. There's a large aggregate, but only one bit moves off. So it's sort of replenishing the small mass end of things 
aggregation is causing mergers of masses, and but you're replen replenishing it with a small noise. Okay. Um, in detail, these models are actually quite different, but the the phenomena that finally come in are similar, and that's why I put them together. So in both of them, there's a critical density, rho c, above which a condensate forms. Condensate here means on one side of the system, there's a large number of particles. In fact, a finite fraction of all the particles reside on that one side. A little bit reminiscent of perhaps of Bose and then condensation, whatever, but this is what is condensate. Where does it form? That's not known in priori. There's some symmetry breaking and forming there. You know, translational symmetry is broken and it happens. Um, and as I said, a finite fraction of all the mass will reside on that condensate. Yeah. But let me describe the models in a little more detail. Um, so here is the zero range process. Uh, so you have particles which are moving on your lattice and reaching other lattice sites on which there already may be uh, some particles. And if they're there, they just go and coalesce with them. At the same time, there's a breakage. So particles can leave different sites, but at rates which depend on the current occupants. For instance, a four particle cluster, there's a rate U4, uh, U10 for the other one, and so on. Uh, the process is stochastic, described by a master equation like here. And uh, the moves I've described already, single particles hop at rate U, which depends on the current mass on the site. Two versions of the model, symmetric or asymmetric, depending on where the particles break off. They might break off symmetrically or asymmetrically. Turns out that the, this model is exa exactly solvable for in its steady state. If you ask what the steady state is, it's actually a product measure. So the model was defined and in this sense solved by Spitzer long, long ago. Uh, but the interesting feature that I'm going to focus on is that for a particular set of, a particular family of uh, uh, U of M, there is going to be condensation of this sort. So in both cases, symmetric and asymmetric, the steady state, to the extent that you want to characterize it by occupancies, is exactly the same. So, good. Ah, there's an interesting uh, point I'll just make in passing, I won't dwell on this, is that with these sorts of mass models, there's a Interesting traffic, quote, traffic analog that one can define. You can imagine going to this U10 and laying it out horizontally, and U4 and laying it out horizontally, and so you, this picture becomes something on a single line. The mass becomes the headway in front of the particle, and in that sense, if you think of cars moving at different rates and so on and so forth, you might have a traffic model. And, uh, you know, sometimes by playing with these rates, you, you can even make it a little bit realistic, like Martin did many years ago. Right. Okay. So uh, this is one of the virtues of the zero range model, um, the phase transition. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so as I said, the steady state of the model, the probability of having a set of masses Mi is, in fact, a product measure form. But importantly, there is, of course, really a, in a conservation law. There is a delta function which tells you that the number of particles won't change in time. Okay. And uh, nevertheless, solvable, uh, as I said, and the solution, uh, the, the weight on each side, depends on the product of the uh, rates for leaving from one up to that, the, site, the, the mass in question. Turns out that if the 
if you choose, so this is a question of choice, if you choose u of k, the rates uh, which depend on k, the current occupancy, in the following way, so this is well known and well studied by many of the people in this room, u of k uh, as a constant plus b over k, where b is larger than two, then there is a critical uh, density. Value is one over b minus two, and for rho larger than rho c, a condensate holds a fraction of all particles. All right, and the very nice uh, article, which you know has not only condensation, uh, the condensate in that aspect, but all aspects of the zero range process, that by Martin and Hanny many years ago. Right. Okay. Uh, what do I do? Oh, it's come back. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. Here's the other model that I'll talk about. So I'll talk about results for both in parallel. So large features are similar. The details are different. But uh, the model a priori is sort of quite different. So what we have is fragmentation from a, a particular site like here. Here you have a bunch of particles, and when a particle can move off symmetrically, only symmetrically is important here, uh, with rate w to the right or left. Um, on the other hand, any bunch of particles, these conglomerates or clusters, can themselves move. Unlike the zero-inch clusters which were there, and they chipped, but they didn't move. But these guys move around. They move with a diffusion constant d, which is independent of the mass. Okay. You might question the physicality of it, but this is the model. Right. Okay, it turns out, again, there's a condensation phase transition in this model at high enough density. How high? Well, higher than rho c, given by this expression. We first found it within a mean field theory. Long, long ago in this paper in 1998. But then later in very nice work by Rajesh and Satya, they showed that this result is actually exact, independent of the mean field approximation, and it holds in all dimensions. Just a remark, if the chipping is directed in one direction, then in 1D this transition is lost, as shown by Rajesh and Satya. Superior. And in the case that the diffusion constant depends on the mass, like you might think it goes as one over the mass, well, again, condensation is lost. But there are interesting finite size effects, which I won't uh, elaborate further. Okay, the transition itself, how does it happen and what happens on various sides of it? So here is rho less than rho c. Rho equal to rho c and rho bigger than rho c. So if you ask for the distribution of mass on a given site, P of m, right, that falls exponentially at large m for, um, you know, as long as you're in the, um, uh, well, dilute regime, rho less than rho c. This happens once in a while. Uh, nothing that I'm doing, I hope. Right, okay, right. Anyway, so here it is, an exponential fall. But now imagine increasing the density. At some point, the decay is a power law. The power is five by two, m to the minus five by two. And uh, you would plausibly and correctly identify this as a critical point. Um, now, if you go ahead, add more particles to the system. Well, this power law doesn't change. Not only the power, but also the amplitude. It remains what it was. Uh, but the excess mass is dumped into the condensate. This is why I said it's sort of reminiscent of Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, be that as it may. Um, if you examine, well, so if you ask, 
how much mass is there in the condensate, that's average m star, it's the excess mass, rho minus rho c times system size. I'm, okay, I forgot to say, but I'm dealing with one dimension, right? We're gonna be interested in fluctuations. So the variance, uh, you know, you can see is grows in some fashion, it depends on the value of B. So these are results, I should have cited this. Uh, um, I've done it somewhere else. This is a nice paper by uh, Martin, Satya, and Royce Zier, uh, which uh, amongst other things derives this. Um, and uh, in the other aggregate model, there's no analytic result, but this is a numerical result for the growth of the variance. Okay, uh, as I said, I'm going to actually use extreme value uh, statistics to uh, describe this. Uh, Evan, could you just warn me 10 minutes before I'm through? And uh, yeah, uh, uh, so the extreme value uh, mass you know, follows the Gumbel distribution in this case, a fresh A in this case. And here, of course, the largest value will be the condensate. And so this will tell you about, you know, variations of the condensate, but it's not a priori that simple, to, uh, you know, uh, an exercise because of the mass constraint. And this is the problem that was solved by the set of three people I mentioned a little while back. Okay, so, okay, here, here, so I've said it here now. So these are the, uh, so, uh, so because of the correlations implied by the conservation, the uh, uh, extreme value distribution departs from the familiar, you know, fresh air, a gumbel or viable forms. It's, it's a different function, but it's known. It's non-Gaussian or B less than three, but it's a Gaussian, simple Gaussian for uh, B larger than three. And uh, okay, numerics confirms that. In this conserved mass model, again, it's a distribution that you can find. It's not, uh, you know, uh, something that, that, that's very familiar, at least to us. And uh, it, it has uh, this particular form that I put down here. These people had actually studied the variance earlier, so I put the reference down as well. Okay, so this is uh, my summary of the steady state properties. You remember what I said, my interest or aim today is to tell you how is the steady state reached. Okay, so let me move to that. So I'll focus on fluctuations. You know, mean values, okay. But uh, we'll do that by monitoring extreme value distributions. And we'll try to explain. Now, you might ask, what, what is there to explain? Because you have costing and you reach a steady state. Turns out there's some uh, strange thing that happens. So that needs explanation. And we'll try to at least plausibly explain. Just a quick summary or reminder of costing theory. So costing refers to. Uh, let's say in the traditional context, a, a quench from a very high temperature disordered state to a low temperature ordered state. And what happens in time is that domains of the ordered phase form and grow. The only thing you should uh, remember from the slide is that there is a growing length scale. And this is of course very important. This is the heart of you know, the modern theory of costing. There's an L, script L of T that I've called which grows as a power law in time. Okay, yeah, here it is, t to the one by z. And uh, um, the point about the uh, L of t is that, uh, you know, things within L of t are very strongly correlated. Outside, they are not. And uh, conventional wisdom is that on length scales that are inside that big drop, you know, uh, of size L of t, the situation should be like steady state. Well, it's not going to be in our models, and that is why I, you know, put this up. Uh, 
it's not going to be that in the sense that if you look at the steady state uh, fluctuations that we already talked about, if you looked at this ratio of the standard deviation to the average of the condensate mass, that goes to zero. It goes to zero in different ways depending on details of the model, but it goes to zero. So it's well contained is my summary, but that's not true while coarsening. All the time while coarsening, this standard deviation is as large in, you know, as the mean. So this is the point I want to make and you know, reconcile with the steady state. Right. So let's address it in terms of EVDs, meaning extreme value distributions. We start out with a disordered state, let me say. So, you know, a completely disordered state. So the initial state distribution of the extreme values is a Gumbel distribution, no surprise but it has to go in time, reach a steady state, which is here. The steady state depends on the model, it's slightly different, but it is well characterized. And our question is what happens in between? And at the lowest level, you just imagine what will happen. Well, you have this length L of t. So within L of t, you know, the guys there don't know about the size of the system, so they will try to form many condensates of their own. You know, in each section, so if I imagine large system L, and I have these boxes of size L of t, within each box you'll begin to form a condensate. After all, the system has a tendency to do that. And here are some pictures as time goes by, and as usual in costening, whatever happens as structure, you know, you get fewer of it as time passes, but more space out. So that much certainly happens. The thing you would like to confirm, of course, first of all, is, you know, is there a, a um, scaling of the correlation functions? There is in the two models, except it's an anti-correlation. These are negative, and it has to be so because you form these condensates which are much bigger than the average size, and there are all these guys which are, you know, order one sitting around, and so, you know, it's very plausible, and in fact happens that you have an anti-correlation between uh, masses at different sites. That's different sites. Of course, not, not everything is anti correlated but this is an average, right? There's very good scaling of the anti, so this is unscaled and scaled, oops, unscaled, scaled, when you scale, so, so what I'm plotting is the G of R and T, the two-point correlation function, at different times. Here it is. And then scaling the separation by L of T, there's a collapse. So this is what I was saying. Of course, there's a peak at R equal to zero. That is the condensate dominating everything else, the small condensates. All right, so what we would like to do then is to literally look at these bins of size L of t. So let me imagine doing that. So I have this system, and I'll just divide it into bins of order L of t. I know exactly how L of t behaves in time, so we can do that. And I expect that across bins, there'll be very weak correlations. Within bins, there'll be strong correlations. And, uh, you know, we'll see what we get in the end. Uh, L of t grows in particular ways depending on the model, and this goes back to earlier work listed there. Uh, and we will be studying actually two cases, the CMAM and the ZRP for a particular value of B, which, okay, I mean, is larger than 3, 3.5, so, the functions that we're dealing with are simple, they're Gaussian, I mean the EVDs, right, okay. So the question is, what happens to the mass distributions in a bin of size L of t, right? So this is what I'm going to monitor. So this is what it looks like. Okay, so just uh, pause a minute and then understand all this. 
the right hand side is a scaled version of the left, but first look at the left. So there are different times, by the way, going between L of t equal to 200 to something quite big. I mean, so there's a, a large variation of time uh, from one curve to the other. But you notice a big fat peak on the right, that is the condensate peak, right? You also see some peak on the left, and I'll try to explain why that happens. And the best way to explain things is by scaling. Okay, so, so let me first of all say that when you scale the mass, remember condensate masses are proportional to system size. So therefore, while coarsening, condensate masses ought to be proportional to L of t. They are. All right, so here's a collapse of those right-hand sides. Not very perfect for small tanks, but getting better and better as time increases. And here's a separate scaling which collapses the left sides. And what is this left side due to? Remember we had this system, size L. We have these bins, L of t. Many, but not all the, of the bins contain a condensate. Some of them don't, because after all, this is a stochastic process. The ones that don't, what do they do? They have the power law distribution. So then if it's a power law, they ought to be described as fresh air. And they are. So the black line there is a fresh air. So once you scale differently, which you need to do for the small guys, they scale perfectly. So we understand, at least at this level, why there are two peaks, why they, pe why they scale differently, and this is the way they do it. All right, so I've just said that here. The large M uh, peak is due to many condensates, and uh, the mean and, but now, this is the key point, right? I mean, this scale, there's a scaling function, whatever it is. But that means the mean and standard deviation grow in the same way. In steady state, on the other hand, there were fluctuations, but the st standard deviation was much smaller than, uh, uh, than, than the mean. So how do you reconcile these? Because in time, L of t will reach L. And so something must happen. So what happens? All right, but before we go there, I should show you similar data for the L of t we determined in the following way. Uh, okay, first of all, you know, from the old arguments, that were there, that it ought to go like t to the one by z, with z equal to three in the symmetric ZRP or two in the asymmetric. And no, but for us, I mean, even if you didn't know that, what we did is we took the two-point correlation function and we looked at its scaling as a function of time and we found that it collapses when you scale r by L of t. So L of t is a simple power. It's in fact t to the half for the CMAM, it's also t to the half for the ZRP in this case because we're looking at the asymmetric version. Yeah, is that okay? You look puzzled, but, 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 but okay. We've checked it for the symmetric case also. I can show you the data if there's a question, but uh, it works. But, but you know, this, most of our study is on the asymmetric case simply because it's, yeah, a little faster. Sure. No, I'm working with periodic boundary conditions. That's going to be very relevant. It's a very key point, finally, to resolution of what is going on. But it, uh, I don't think so, because the moment you have a condense, I mean, you're looking at blindly at, you know, two points separate, I mean, anywhere in the system, and the con fact of a condensate dominates. So long as you have boundary conditions which will support a condensate, 
you'll have negative corrections, I believe. But we haven't checked this explicitly, but uh, the, yeah. Okay. But uh, the fact of boundary conditions is going to be quite crucial, yeah, right, in final understanding of what is going on, right? Okay, so this, what, this is for us a puzzle. The puzzle is that, look, the scaling uh, in, during costing is, is at odds with the scaling in steady state, and the prob problem will be very acute when L of T becomes order L because you know, something happened. So, so we didn't, uh, I mean, we, we were also at a loss as to what will happen. So anyway, so then we decided, look, rather than looking at these individual maxima in different bins, let's look at the global maximum. Because after all, the, if you look at all these maxima and take their maximum, that is the global maximum. So let's look at the variance of the largest mass that has formed up to time t. How does it behave? So that begins to give us a key to the answer. So this is the behavior in time. Here is the steady state answer, that flat region. Uh, this is done for um, different sizes. So blue is smallest, red is largest. The mean is also shown here, by the way. And the mean just goes very nicely monotonically to its steady state value, nothing surprising, but the variance does not. I mean, before it goes here, it goes way above and then crashes down. Uh, well, it does that in both models. So clearly there's some new physics or something, I mean, I don't know, that sounds like very grandiose, but uh, there's something going on which is governing this. Okay, what can it be? So, uh, yeah, so the point we wanted to make is that there are giant fluctuations on the way to steady state. And sort of suggests that, you know, what is going on, see the coarsening regime is here. Usually it's governed by steady state, but now we would claim it's not, can't be really, I mean, after all, steady state is right in that, yeah. You see, must be determined by something else, some pre-asymptotic state. So to find out, all we did is to look at con configurations here, there, here, there. And of course, what happens is the number of mini condensates keeps dropping until you reach this point. Okay, well, yeah. So close to the maximum, the number of condensates, if you call them, that is, Small, so order two or three or four. Right, and the rest of the curve is just relaxing those to your single concept. So, but why should the variance be so large if you have two? So let, I hope I have it here. Okay, this is to show that this is not only in one dimension, but also two dimensions. Same thing happens, huge fluctuations. Uh, all right, there's a particular scaling. Now, how, how am I doing with respect to time? 11 minutes, okay, okay. All right, well, yeah, we'll finish quite easily. Um, uh, so let me not dwell on this. I mean, there are, there's a cer certain scaling uh, that is obeyed by the variance, but differently on one, these sides one and two, after all, it's approaching a constant value on the right. So. Let's skip that. But let's understand the source of this business. So here it is. So here is a picture for the ZRP. So at some time, L of T, we have these, uh, at some time T, we have these large condensates. And what are they doing? They're exchanging mass. Near the top of that variance curve, let's say there were only two, like here. What's going to happen? I mean, there's an exchange of mass between the two. Finally, you will reach steady state with one. But during that process, one mass, large mass, has to go to zero. The other one, 
I did something just right. Will it come back? <laughs> okay. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so the point was that these two are sort of fluctuating, but one of them goes to zero, one of them goes there. So clearly the fluctuation is huge. It's order of the mean. So what I'm giving you is a plausibility, uh, plausible understanding without any detailed theory of why during that time in that pre-asymptotic regime, you have huge fluctuations. So perhaps it's this, this pre-asymptotic state which is sort of governing what is happening during Cossin, not the final state. That is the thesis. Now, what about in the CMAP? Well, it's a li little different because everything moves, including the condensate. So the way the condensate is picking up mass is actually it's moving through the rest and it's picking up, of course, it's throwing out a little bit. Uh, right. So then we recall some work done years ago by Himani and others on the same process, coming back to this is a question, with free boundary conditions, open boundary conditions with the injection of single particles on one side, but allowing anything that reaches the boundary to leave. But what might reach the boundary is the condensate. When it leaves, a finite fraction of all the mass goes. Right, so you have enormous fluctuations because of that. So it is this process, if you like, and okay, th these are actual, um, from this paper, the variation of the mass with time. And you can see these huge crashes, intermittent crashes that happen in that case. So exactly that is happening on the scale of L of t. Because after all, within L of t, there's a condensate. Then you can move out and there you are, you've lost it. So it's not so difficult in the end to reconcile why you have large fluctuations, even in this case. Okay, so I'm close to the end of the talk. Uh, maybe this is the end, I've forgotten. Yeah, it is, all right. So this is what I want to leave you all with. Uh, so we've looked at two models, both exhibiting a condensate in the sense of a large cluster at a given site. Um, steady state allows for fluctuations, but they're contained. Coarsening, the fluctuations are as large as the mean, while coarsening. So we conclude that at least in you know, some of these models, the behavior within a coarsening length L of t is not governed by what's happening in the steady state, but rather what is happening in a state that sort of comes before the steady state. And uh, you know, what has helped us in all this is extreme value distributions. And so maybe they help elsewhere in the study of coarsening. But I don't know. Uh, there is perhaps the same thing said in a sort of pictorial way here. So here is the random state and here is the steady state. So there is like a straight and narrow path which would have gone there. But the system doesn't do that. It excurses to other sorts of states, draws in something from them, and that governs what the coarsening is. Okay. All right. With that, I'll stop. Thank you.